what I wanted to do is um, ask everyone to um, observe a minute of silence for the victims in Buffalo. Um, before anything else, like so, we'll just I'll just count here in the in the clock a minute. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, I think it's really important that we honor and take a minute to reflect on the things that have been happening in this country um, for a long while now, um, and that have been aggravated with COVID, especially directed to, to um, the API community. Um, before we start also, I would like to um, thank Sunny Lee for organizing this amazing event. Um, Sunny is our Asian Pacific Islander um, student coordinator, affinity coordinator. And she has been doing a brilliant job um, during this past year. And I also wanna thank um, Professor Leslie Lum for all that she does for not only API students, but all students here in campus. Um, she's a mentor to, to many students. She's a reference, a guide, a, a refugee, <laughs> like where some, some place that we, we can go, at re refuge for us students here uh, on campus. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank her for for the amazing job that she does, um, not only as a teacher, but also guiding us and supporting us in every step of the way. And I wanna thank you all that are here, all students who took uh, time to be here with us this afternoon. And um, first let's start introducing our, our guest speakers here, these amazing women um, that are with us this afternoon and, and um, so, so kindly took the time to be here. So we have Representative Mi Ling Tai, Senator Manka Dingra, and Representative Vandana Slater. And um, if you could please um, introduce yourselves, I think that that's um, best for everyone. Um, if you can talk a little bit about yourselves and and what got you into politics and 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 um, a little, just give us a little background. Thank you so much. Do you want us to go in the order that you chose? Yes, yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> We're very good with that. <laughs> so um, because of that, I'm going to go ahead and kick start. Uh, thank you so much, um, Bellevue College, for uh, organizing an event like this and give us really the opportunity to be engaged um, with, with students and faculties um, as a whole. Um, um, I strongly believe that our work wouldn't be uh, far and meaningful and, and effective without engaging the public and especially the individuals, the people who are being impacted by these policies. And um, um, I am honored uh, to serve as state representative for the 41st legislative district. Uh, my name is Mi Lin Tai. I am a refugee from Vietnam. Um, I came to this country in 1983. Um, the unique ex experience that I've had was uh, that um, in high school, I uh, did not speak a word of English. And so um, in my space of representing um, in uh, Olympia in, in the state legislature, I am um, still the first and only refugee representing in the state legislature, um, um, really having uh, a voice um, in um, our policies, uh, formations and, 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 um, and implementation. Um, what got me into politics? Oh goodness, that is, you know, it's actually is a loaded question. Um, and and in fact, I, I think for many of like for at least the three of us here, and I'm I'm imagining for for many people of people of color who chose to go in public service, um, this is the important question because to me it's the why. 
Um, and, um, and each of us might, uh, might respond to it based on our personal experience, but in the end, um, we, we, we might find uh, our commonality. So for me, uh, specifically, I got in politics first to run as school board director for the Bellevue School District. So I'm very familiar with the running start. I'm very familiar of how uh, we're trying to collaborate between the Bellevue School District and Bellevue College as a whole. Um, was because I, um, I happened to uh, read um, two essays written by two students graduating from Sammamish High School, identi identified themselves as undocumented students. And I, um, as a PTA, volunteer PTA mom, I ran around looking for resources to support um, these students to achieve their dreams. Uh, they were the, 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 the one who reminded me of the, the teen me. Um, long ago, uh, when I first came to this country, um, having a dream, want to achieve it, and, um, and finding all the barriers and challenges um, to, to meet that dream. Um, and so they were the force behind why I decided to run to serve as school board director. Uh, the force behind why I ran um, as state representative, uh, really, um, um, as I as I introduce myself, I am a, a refugee. Um, <laughs> it's 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 a complex thing because from time um, you feel like it's a scarlet letter that you wear in front of your chest, being a refugee, um, and then at time I felt that there's a need to be comfortable, even if it is a solid letter, because we have our stories um, and our contributions. I, I ran because at the time, the president of the United States uh, would paint a picture and tell a different narratives of refugees in our country and immigrants in our country. Um, I wanted to be in a public space to show up uh, in the public space, what a refugee looked like, uh, what a refugee could do, and, and how far can a refugee uh, move as far as contributing our worth um, into this country. And, and, and we, are, we are not what, uh, like telling a different narrative uh, from what the, uh, the president of the United States has been, um, has been using his platform um, and say so in the public space. Uh, so I stopped there and um, I will kick it off to Senator Dinkra. Thank you. Um, thank you, first of all, Bellevue College and to um, the professors we see there, here and the students we see here for, putting this together and for making time to have this conversation. So my name is Manka Tingra. I am the Deputy Majority Leader on the Washington State Senate. I chair a Law and Justice Committee. I sit on the Behavioral Health Subcommittee and I sit on Ways and Means. I um, did not have um, um, a life in politics. Uh, this was the first office I ever ran for and won. Um, in my previous job, I was a senior deputy prosecuting attorney with King County, and I did that for, gosh, 18 years. I created the first therapeutic alternative unit where I did a lot of work on alternatives to incarceration, on criminal justice reform, on crisis intervention, trauma-informed care. So really doing a lot of work on um, alternatives in our criminal justice system. And I got involved in uh, hate crimes after 9-11 when a sick cab driver was assaulted in Seattle. At that time, um, the Seattle Police Department created a advisory group that was the Muslim Sikh Arab Advisory Group. And I was a part of that where we had a lot of conversations and uh, talked a lot about hate crimes in our society and how to address them. This was 9-11, um, that was 20 years ago. And then we have 2016, right? And, um, you know, I considered myself a good Democrat. I voted. I had great discussions, political discussions on the dinner table and spoke with family and friends. And I thought I was, I did a great job. Um, and then in November 2016, I really felt I had to re-examine what I had been doing with my life. 
And I knew that I had to get involved. I just didn't know what that involvement would look like. And a very good friend of mine, who's now the mayor of Redmond, uh, she actually saw me at my first Democratic Party meeting in December. I showed up and there were a lot of new people, a lot of women like me who showed up, uh, who didn't know what they wanted to do, but knew that they, they had to do something. And um, she told me, she said, I think you should run for office. And my response to her was, I don't think I'm qualified. And she just busted out laughing. And only later did I realize that what a cliche my answer was. Apparently, that is what all women said. Apparently, women of color say that more often. And that was just the first few words that came to my mind. And, you know, over the years, because of the work I've done in criminal justice reform and behavioral health, um, you know, people would tell me and gender based violence, people would say, oh, you should think of running for office, but never, never did I ever take it seriously. And then two very specific things happened that December, I was at the local mosque in Redmond, and they had a community forum, and it was this huge auditorium full of people. I was there, we had a six uh, local uh, city police chiefs there. And in this huge room, people after people stood up and said, they didn't know if they should buy a car or whether they should buy a house, um, whether they would be allowed to live in this country. And I just remember sitting there thinking, um, you know, I come from a sick family. The men in my, in my family wear turbans and grew up in California. And, you know, we've had incidents with, um, with hate crimes and, and, and with the men wearing turbans, but I never ever felt that I couldn't belong to this country. And then two days after that, I was at the Indian Association of Western Washington. There was a safety forum um, at the Bellevue Community Center, actually. And uh, I was there. We had a U.S. Um, um, assistant attorney there. We had an FBI agent there. And this was a room full of Indians talking about in how in Sammamish, Redmond, Bellevue, um, one parent told me that their kid had been told that they were going to get deported. And so it was that weekend that um, my husband and kids, we sat down and we chatted and we decided that I was going to run for office because it is so important for our community uh, to see people who look like us in the halls of power. Um, that sense that we belong is there because when you look at who the decision makers in our state are, they have to see themselves reflected there. So I'm just so glad to be here with Rep Ty and uh, Rep Slatter because representation does matter. It has a huge impact. And I'll just say that year when I won in 2017, I doubled the Women of Color Caucus from one to two. And people are all excited about it. And I go, no, think about it. In the state of Washington, we had one woman of color senator in 2016. It's shameful. Um, now we're up to six. And uh, this is just the women of color in the Senate. The House is just doing its own thing and leading the charge. But I'll say in the Democratic caucus in Washington, the Senate and um, House, we're 50% women. Uh, that does not happen in other states. And so thank you for having this conversation. I'm really proud to be here. And I'll just say one thing before I turn it over to Representative Slatter is that you know hate crimes are these horrific acts of violence. They affect individuals and their families. But more than that, they actually poison a whole community because they just don't, um, they just don't impact those individuals that, that are directly related to violence. It is that whole community feels unwelcome and feels that burden of that hatred. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to uh, Representative Slatter. Thank you so much, Senator Dingra. It's always an honor to listen to you and uh, to hear your fight and your passion because you know we're so lucky to have you in the Senate and what Senator Dingra I think if you followed her career didn't say but uh, we did not have the majority in the Senate until she was elected and so her uh, election was a catalyst to a lot of amazing progressive policies that put people first that put you know centered our values. And um, it was just wonderful to see uh, some of the, the, the bills that were passed simply because she was there. And so I'm grateful to the stories that you heard in the mosque to bring you here. And I'm grateful to all of you for being here and being engaged. Um, I have to say that what I'm hearing from young people and people who are in college and other spaces where you're trying to find that path to meaningful work in life um, regardless of your age, um, 
there's a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness right now that seems to be pervading a lot of conversations. I see it on social media. People share it with me. You know, what's the point, you know, of us voting or of moving forward when we see things like Roe versus Wade being overturned, when we see this type of hatred and gun violence and all of that. And, um, and I just want to, um, you know, echo what you've heard from my, my two colleagues, uh, that a collective action and representation really matter. And, you know, I got to tell you, it struck me today that the people who are perpetrating these types of pol policy changes and legal effects are people that have been playing a very long game. And we have to play a long game. We have to recognize that we in collective action can play a long game. And I just want to talk about that from the standpoint of um, Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood and um, the right to abortion access and the right to self-determination for women. Because um, in 1970, uh, we, um, we passed abortion access in Washington state before Roe versus Wade. In 1991, we actually had a referendum to codify Roe versus Wade. And that's because people came together and had rallies and watched other states and other women. And there were voices that collectively worked. So we have had a, a little bit of a defense and a space, a safe space for other women who might travel here to have these procedures. And so I just, you know, I just want to say that, yes, it feels hopeless and it feels helpless. But um, I also believe it's a little bit of a pendulum and you cannot give up and you must stay the course, and we really need you to. And this issue of women's health has been one of the reasons why I'm um, in public office. Um, I'm, my name is Vandana Slatter, and I grew up in Canada. Uh, I was the eldest of three daughters of Indian immigrants from India, and I lived most of my life straddling two cultures. Um, so I wasn't completely ethnically Indian in my life, and nor was I completely white. And so um, I have had to figure out how to navigate this world and also be respectful and want to be respectful of my family and my culture. And everything is a strength, right? Like we bring those strengths of diversity into getting us to where we need to be. But it's hard, right? Because it depends on what room you're in. And most of the rooms I I studied in or worked in did not look like me, um, and they were mostly all white. And uh, then when I went home, uh, then, you know, and, and with my family, then there was really not a lot of white people in there. And so trying to straddle those two worlds has been a little bit of what I've, I've had to navigate, but has, again, been also a strength. And I'll just give you a quick example. I'll give you three quick stories, and that then that will kind of give you a sense of who I am. Uh, one is my name. My, my name is Vandana. It's Sanskrit for prayer or salute. A lot of people from India in all different aspects and backgrounds, and they know this word and it's meaningful to them. And what I love is when I say my name to people, they smile <laughs> if they know the meaning. And that makes me feel wonderful. I married a Canadian, white Canadian, Irish, British, research scientist and so my last name is Slatter so it's really hard for people to figure out where <laughs> that came from but when I grew up everyone called me bandana because that's phonetically how it's spelt even my teachers and it was and I didn't correct them because I wasn't surrounded by anyone who looked like me and then when I went to work I was um, Van and my husband actually met me as Van his family sometimes still calls me Van um, and I worked with a man he his name was Van and we were on phones. I was a pharmacist and we were taking medical and information calls. So you had to kind of be quick to say your name and not confuse people. So, um, so then both of us were Van, it was confusing. So I said, well, you know, my name's actually Vandana, so you could call me Vaughn. So then for a number of years, almost 10 years, everyone called me Vaughn. And so again, some people still do. And it wasn't until I ran for office and I thought, what am I going to put on my sign? And it became Vandana. And so uh, basically, if you call me Van, I know what year you know me from, <laughs> probably before 1985 or something. <laughs> so it's like, it's sort of been the story of my life and my, and my acceptance of my representation and my presence, sort of like, you know, so I was inspired by Barack Obama, you know, he was Barry for a long time, became Barack. 
And so I think that for young people who are growing up multi-generationally in family or our second generation or first generation, um, these are always different challenges. So um, I wanted to give you that story. Um, the second story is when I, um, I was a pharmacist and I actually went and worked in biotech and the pharma and drug development for 20 years. And I did science. I was a good Asian girl, um, you know, in the sense that, you know, we work hard. We, are, we want to make sure that education matters, that we have a life um, that is meaningful and um, can, can make it sustainable for the rest of our family. My father is a physician. Um, he grew up in a very small, poor town, poor village in um, India. He was on a farm, uh, no running water, um, you know, um, outdoor kitchen. And uh, he was a he was an amazing pioneer, uh, I would say. Most of our parents are, if you're first generation. And uh, so I became a pharmacist, and I worked in um, the industry and in the hospital for a long time. Um, then I. Um, I actually worked for Pfizer for about a year because Pfizer bought the company I was in. And uh, I did not want to stay with Pfizer. I didn't want to stay with pharma. So I decided I would do a master's of public administration at the University of Washington. And uh, so that's where I came to do that. And uh, through that, I realized that I really wanted to do public service. And I thought, well, maybe it would be um, developing countries could really use great medicines. So I thought about PATH and um, the Gates Foundation and the vaccine work they were doing because I had this background. And um, I still wasn't sure. I, so I interned with Senator Maria Cantwell and I got to meet a lot of really amazing women leaders in the political world. And one of them invited me to be on the board of NARAL, the foundation board of NARAL. They needed a healthcare professional as a pharmacist. And at the time, there were pharmacists in Washington State who were, who were voting um, on, on the uh, rule that would allow them to um, refuse to fill an emergency contraception prescription. And um, so I went and testified that I didn't think this was a good idea. This is a slippery slope. And eventually I got on the board of pharmacy and we voted on a rule to um, ensure that time sensitive medication, including emergency contraception would be filled. And it was challenged by um, Christian pharmacists in um, Olympia and other places. And this case went all the way up to the United States. It went to the court of appeals that actually upheld our rule that uh, said that women should be able to access emergency contraception, but then it was challenged again and was um, went before the Supreme Court. It actually didn't go before the Supreme Court, but it was on their, their, their list. And at that time, um, Justice Scalia had died. And so there were only eight members on the court and they actually chose not to hear the, hear it, uh, the case, which meant that our rule was upheld. And the dissenting opinion, the minority dissenting opinion was uh, Samuel Alito. And it was a blistering 15 page opinion. And it was actually, in a weird way, one of the best days of my life because we won. Um, but um, but it just comes to, goes to show you that um, this type of attack has been happening for a very long time. The third, quickly, story is that when I was um, when I was um, a mom, but it, just to finish that really quickly, but it was the first place that I'd seen where politics and government were intersectional with my background as a healthcare professional, which typically had been fairly apolitical and much more science-based. So that was the first step along a 10-year nonlinear path getting me to public office. <laughs> but um, uh, the only other thing I would say is I don't want to take up any more time is just that um, there's a, another story I'd like to share about what I believe my mission is in office. And so I can hold on that, Jordana, since these were just introductions or I'm happy to share it. You can share it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, very quickly. Um, so I, I, I'm just thinking about it because right now I was hearing about the, um, the baby formula um, shortage right now. Um, so I, I got pregnant with my son. Um, so I'm dating myself, but he was born in 96. He actually went to Bellevue College, got an associate's degree here. Um, he's at OSU now. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great place for him. And so um, and uh, he was born and I wanted to stay home with him and breastfeed him. Now he was born a little early, so he was slightly underweight. So I had to supplement my breast milk with baby formula. So I cannot imagine what some women are 
going through right now if they want to keep their kids, giving them a strong start to life. But um, so I took the 21 week unpaid leave that the Family Medical Leave Act provides nationally, federally. And I was able to stay six, home, six months home and then get my job back. It was a different job. Um, it was doing clinical research on an antibiotic that was, um, you know, gram positive antibiotic that is completely resistant to all other antibacteria, antibi resistant to all other antibiotics. And I was really proud of that work that we did, that research. And 20 years later, um, my dad was dying of cancer and he had to go through surgery and he had this horrible infection. And the only antibiotic that seemed to be doing the trick was linezolid. And it was the one that I had worked on 20 years before when I had had the chance to get my job back after having had family medical leave. So you can imagine sitting beside his bedside, um, it gave him a few extra days with us, but looking up in an IV bag that you know that you had an opportunity to have um, worked on that medicine. Um, that is what government does. That is what good, effective government does. It removes barriers so people can thrive and achieve their full potential. There was a president who did not know me from a hole in the wall and got this family medical leave past uh, Clinton. And, uh, and then because of that, my son got a strong start to life and my father had extra time with us as a family. So that is my mission and purpose. Um, in the work that I do is to make sure government represents everyone and that we also um, reduce barriers so people can thrive. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Representative Vandana, for, for sharing this. Um, I, I'm a little um, moved right now. So um, thank you so much. Uh, so let, let's get to our questions. Um, Representative Vandana, like you were talking about, like this sense of hopelessness and helplessness. And, and I, I do feel that like so many times, you know, like, so um, my first question to you all, like, and you can go like in, in any order is, um, can we make any progress, you know, and how can we make that progress? Because I think that it, it's important to start discussing like, and even like to, to see a light in the end of this tunnel and, and to start giving um, people hope because it's, it's heartbreaking um, and it, it's just horrifying the things that we're seeing. You know, I'll, I'll just tell you that when I started working in, in the realm of um, hate crime over 20 years ago and to what's happening now, even though it doesn't feel like change has been made, there is a lot of change. 20 years ago, we were all in silos. When, when a hate crime occurred against one community, that community dealt with it. Now, um, they're still happening and we still have to address the underlying causes of that. But now when that happens, you see everyone coming together in support. And that is progress because we understand that um, we are all interconnected and interdependent. And what, what happens to someone happens to us as well. And so um, even, for, you know, when I told you the story about the sick cab driver being assaulted and, and us uh, creating that advisory uh, community group, those meetings were really horrid. Like we would go there and people were fighting. People were unhappy with each other. We had to learn how to have a respectful discourse. And then I told you about the, the meeting at the mosque that we went to where law enforcement was there, a, a whole... Um, you know, a huge auditorium full of people, the tenor was completely different. Everyone was there in solidarity. Everyone understood that we were there for each other to support each other. It wasn't like different groups were fighting for the same resource. We understood there's enough to go around and we have to come together in order to move forward. So um, it is, it is horrific what continues to happen and we don't want that to happen anymore. But the way the community is showing up for each other, to me, that's tremendous. And that's progress. And I know Reptai was just telling us what she's doing next. And that speaks volumes to what, what is happening in our communities now, where we are showing up in solidarity with each other. Thank well, you so much. If you want to jump in, or I can, I can, I can kind of follow Monka, my apologies, like these two women are like my best friends. They both my mentors and 
sort of like the woman that I could call. I know that I could call them at any time and any hours. I can cry. I can be really, really ugly with them. Um, I can be really, really pretty with them. And so it's 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 so normal that I, I get to call them by their first name. And so my my first my apology if that um, that that's kind of strange, um, but we are sisters in arms. Um, and I really wanted to 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 kind of follow what um, Monka was sharing. It is true, and I think um, I think especially for this particular audience, right? This particular audience, or the audience who sat in um, in the space where you hope to acquire knowledge, and and many of us, uh, I would just speak simply about me. So when I acquire knowledge, the knowledge being a refugee, the, the intent of acquiring knowledge at the time when I was your age and in your seat was to get a, a good and secure job. So not only could I feed myself and take care of myself, I could help feed my immediately family and take care of my immediate family and to send a little bit of saving back home because my aunt and uncles and cousins and a lot of the people in my home country in Vietnam would needed that support significantly. I mean, is everything was like about finance, about money, right? And so anything else was, was like, it's not for me, it's for someone else. And I think, I think we, if, if we could look at through the same lens, is that some of these things that happen around us does impact, does impact significantly your, your financial success. We heard about things like um, um, women doing the same job, get paid less than men, right? Gender equality. Uh, we heard about people of color doing the same job, get paid less than white. We heard about people of color uh, being passed um, when there's an opportunity to advance um, in terms of leadership uh, potentials, right? So the reality is it's impact all of us. And I think to acquire knowledge, including that understanding that there is nothing about us without us. And, and when I serve as school board director, just gathering community and talking about um, um, equitable educational system so that every single student in the K-12 system would have the chance to fulfill their best potential. It was, it was like, like, like Senator Dingra says, like it was horrid, it was horrible. Literally, it sent me to the emergency room. I mean, it hurt, it, it hurt us mentally, it hurt us physically, and especially those who sort of like in the arena and do, doing this fight. But can you imagine if like we all go in together, that we all taking care of each other, there's, it's like we are really strong in that in that way. And so what I, you know, to the question, Jordana, is like, what's, you know, what's, what's out there? What's the hope? The hope is really us. We are the hope. And we, are, we have the power to light that light. We have the power to choose how we engage and how we interact and, and especially how what the destiny for all of us be. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question, uh, I'm gonna direct this to Representative Vondana. Um, the problems seem to be intractable, causing rifts between Asian and other communities when the perp perpetrators are sometimes people of color. It gets entangled with the lack of mental health services and police reform. How do we sort all this out? Can you repeat the first part of the question? Sorry? I'm sorry. My, it could be my uh, bottom. Uh, um, so the problems seem to be intractable, causing rifts between Asians and other communities when perpetrators are sometimes people of color. It gets entangled with the lack of mental health service and police reform. How do we sort um, all of this out? 
this this conflicts between um, minority groups and, and 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 different groups and like this mental health um, crisis that we're living in, especially coming out of COVID, that was so damaging to so many people. I think. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's it is the question, you know, um, because we are stronger together, right? And yet here we are feeling divided and often. Um, divided amongst ourselves. I think it's Senator Dingra mentioned that we have advanced more than we think in the sense that we are not as siloed as we are, but what this question gets at is that there is still a division there, right? There's still, there's still um, diversity of thought and conflict. Um, and the problem is there's several, right? There's the idea that if, if we just take the pandemic, how connected have we been? really, right? I mean, it's been a, a pretty disconnecting time. And so where do we get our information? Where do we hear about what's real and what's not real? I think it gets to what is, what is truth, right? And I think that that's what's missing a little bit in some of our, um, our information. So first of all, people are, are, because of a pandemic, one in, once in a hundred years, unprecedented, we are divide. We we think we're connected because we're on Zoom and everything, and that's definitely helped and made a big difference. But when you really think about it, we haven't been able to meet with one another and hear and be connected as a person. It's very difficult to target a person or be a hated hate a person that you know in a complex way. And I feel like the simplicity of social media, of the, the, the of our connections, the way we are, and the, the ways that we divide ourselves in how we get information or connect with one another has created this issue. So I do think it's going to be helpful that we are going to be able to hopefully um, safely re-engage with one another, have family events, have conversations. Because remember, remember when Trump got elected, and there were members of our family who were Trumpian, and then there were members who were not, and you would go to a Thanksgiving meal, or maybe there would be no Thanksgiving meal because there was this, you knew that there was this gonna be this real argument and this divide. That we have to get back to the pre-Trump era, if you will, of how we connect with one another and see each other as whole people, as whole selves. I think we also have to attack where that information is coming from, what the source is. But remember, there are people in the, in the, the patriarchy and in the superior, um, the, uh, the white sort of superior space that are believing that their world is declining. And there are people who are adjacent to that, who need that. And so we have to be very cognizant of the power structures that are in place and how are we going to recognize and build capacity? So I guess the bottom line is, is that um, I'm a politician and I know that when I run for office, there are some people who will vote for me no matter what because of my party. And there will be some people who will vote against me no matter what because of my party. And then there are those who, um, who want to solve problems and have conversations. And we have to we have to grow that group. We have to grow that that group. Um, and the mental health issues that you were bringing up, I think, are downstream of some of these impacts, but they may also be upstream as well. And so, um, recognizing in our own families and our own spaces how we can love one another a little bit more, be kinder to one another, to accept diverse views, but express and show each other that we are um, we are human and we have the same needs and we have the same desires, um, that can make a big difference. I don't know if I've touched Thank you so much. Question. So I actually wanted to jump in on this question because people talked about behavioral health and mental illness and that I do a lot of that work. And I wanna be very, very clear with everyone here that individuals who have a mental health disorder or a behavioral health diagnosis are more likely to be victims of crime than perpetrators of violence. And I'm gonna say it once more because it's that important. Individuals with mental illness diagnoses are more likely to be victims of crime rather than perpetrators of violence. 
it's very easy to say that that mass shooter, oh, that person was mentally ill. Actually, I can say he, because frankly, that's what we've seen. Statistically, they are male. Um, but what actually, when you take a look at mass shooters across the spectrum, you know what they have in common, what they have, what's more in common is a history of domestic violence, issues around power and control. Um, and so you really have to take a look at what is enabling this behavior, this sense that they have the power to take someone else's life, that they are the ones who can, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever their belief system is. But to say that this comes back to mental illness, in my mind, that is not the right answer. You have to take a look at power dynamics and power structure. And the second part of that question actually to me deals with um, anti-Blackness. We have to acknowledge that as Asians, uh, we have to acknowledge that as just people living in America, people living in this world, that you have to take a look and honestly take a look at um, communities that frankly have anti-Blackness in them. And that they have those discussions, right? I um, I'm from India. And, you know, when my mom was growing up, you know what they used to sell? This cream called Fair and Lovely. Why? Because the stigma around skin color and everyone wanted to be fair. Everyone wanted to be white, right? It's changing. But there's a lot of undertone of um, anti-Blackness that we have to acknowledge and respond to. And so we cannot say we as people of color are a monolith and that we treat Everyone who's a person of color with equal respect and dignity, that's not true. We all have our own biases. We have our own prejudices and our, our cultures are very split. I can't even say that any one particular culture is Democrat or Republican or hates X, Y, and Z and loves X, Y, and Z. It, that, that's not true at all. So I think we have to have a realistic understanding of that narrative of what does it mean to be a person of color? What does it mean to show up for others in this space and acknowledge um, our own biases and, and prejudices? Um, so I just wanted to make sure I could chime in on that question as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's very clarifying actually, like, and, and it's a different point of view that you're bringing than what's traditionally discussed because, um, and it, it makes complete sense, like what you're talking about, you know, like, and, and yeah, so, so when you start thinking about it, it, it actually like, it, it makes more sense and, and it, it brings more understanding to what is actually happening and, it, and it's a different twist on it, you know, so, so thank you so much. Um, Senator Monka, the next question is for you actually. Uh, and um, there are movements to elevate hate crimes in, um, but in Washington state, in the case of John Hewen, he the family wanted it classified as a hate crime, but it would have resulted in a less severe sentence. Is elevating hate crime a solution? You know, that's a really um, interesting uh, question because years ago in Washington, there's like a little legal 101 lesson, um, we didn't call it a hate crime. Um, we had a different name for it. and. It was really interesting because at, at that time I was still a prosecutor and we talked about that. Like, do we charge this like with a hate crime denominator or do we um, charge it a, in a different way? And at that time, there were concerns that a jury, like in their mind, what is a hate crime? That understanding of what a hate crime is, uh, people felt that would be a barrier to getting convictions, right? Because people thought about slavery. They thought about lynching. And to them, that was a hate crime. So if someone is caught, is being assaulted because of a perception of their race, is that really a hate crime because it's still an assault? And so this is where um, the, the education among individuals has to come in, right? Because you wanna hold people accountable for committing a hate crime. You wanna make sure that the jury has the tools and the legal analysis to get to that conviction. But you also don't want to um, say words or use words that are going to impact the way they make a decision, right? This is all the implicit bias that we talk about. So I think four years ago, in four years ago, five years ago, it's after I got elected, um, we actually had a bill to call it a hate crime. 
And so um, there was a decision made that saying, you know what, I think our society is ready to have that conversation and understanding that hate crime shows up in a lot of different ways. And it is because of it's a crime that occurs because of someone's perception of who you are. And so um, so that was changed. And um, I think it's something we just continue to take a look at and see how we can improve our, our system and really start holding people accountable for the crime that they are um, committing. And I'll just say one other thing. Um, the Law and Justice Committee actually is going to have a um, working session on hate crimes in June. I wish I knew the right date. I didn't think I was plugging the Law and Justice um, Committee work, but you can always watch us on TVW. And so we're taking a look exactly at our hate crime statute, what we're looking at, and also taking a look at restorative justice, right? What happens when a hate crime occurs in a community? And I have, um, you know, gone to communities where this happens, right? The, the mosque in Redmond, they had their, um, their, their, this beautiful ornate stone um, plaque saying who they were destroyed twice. We had the Bellevue Mosque that burnt down. We had the Sikh Gudvara that was vandalized. Um, and, and so I go and, you know, go to these, these events after the fact. And I know, especially with the, with the Sikh Gudvara, uh, some of the people were like, okay, we're going to erect a fence and we're going to have security guard and we're going to have cameras and other people weren't sure what to do. And I said, you know, you cannot have one incident, even though I've talked about how an incident impacts the whole community, you cannot change who you are. You know, you created this, this center because you wanted it to be welcoming. You wanted everyone to feel free to come here. You wanted it to be a community gathering place. The minute you put up that fence, the minute you put up all these security measures, you are isolating yourself from what you said you wanted to be. So how do you show up in the space again? And so you really have to talk about, you can have crimes and charges, but how do you hold people accountable? Like what's the punishment? Locking someone up in prison is not going to suddenly make them feel a different way. But if you have some component of restorative justice, of acknowledging what you have done, acknowledging the harm you have caused, and hearing about that harm from individuals who have gone through it, that's a different modality. So um, we're going to have all of those conversations at the next session. But these these are the things we really have to be have to talk about: is how do you how do you change the needle from there? And you have to have a conversation about this component of having that individual who created harm engaging with the people who that person harmed. Thank you so much, Senator Monka. Um, Representative Tai, um, this is our last question and then we're gonna go to the questions in the chat. Um, it, it appears that hate speech circulating in the internet motivated the alleged shooter in Buffalo. This traveled so easily from New Zealand mosque shooter to many subsequent shootings. What can we, be, what can be done to stop this? Like the first thought entered my mind. I mean, honestly, the first thought entered my mind. I'm curious what Monka and Vondana think, but the, honestly, the first thought entered my mind is like, I don't have the answer. Why are you asking me the question? <laughs> I mean, the reality is, um, to me, the reality is what motivates the, the, these individuals, these terrorists, these extremists, seeded from so many others' um, condition, um, who they interact with, what community they they be embraced in? Um, I I mean Senator Dingra talked about hate crime and how we how we talked about it, look at it, and the 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 piece that critically important in my mind is the restorative justice and how we how we respond post the situation. I wanted to go and talk about sort of related to your previous question to Representative Slatter um, about like how we fight among each other. I remember when I was in college and so that was in sort of like the late eighties, um, there was 
Asian Americans, immigrants before me, certainly our Japanese uh, brother and sisters, our Chinese uh, brother and sisters, and then the, the wave of Southeast Asian refugee, right? The Vietnamese, the Laos, the Hmon, the Khmer. Um, and they are, they are, some of them came here. Um, you heard a lot about boat people, the people who just throw their kids onto the boat and hopefully their kids will get somewhere that they can build a future. But thing again, um, and so I'm trying to, I'm trying to somehow tell the story with this group of audience, because this group of audience is like really young group of audience. But I, I, I once again invite you to, to acquire and inquire knowledge. So, so Asian, specifically Southeast Asian refugee, ended up concentrated in certain states simply because certain states have the power of receiving refugee and certain states have the power of not receiving refugee. Um, following that in, in the 80s, um, the state who chose not to receive refugee basically say, see, we told you so, these refugees are no good because these Southeast Asian refugee ended up form gangsters. So there's gangs, uh, right? Again, right? Um, so, so there's multiple conversations about what happened to an individual. And, 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 and just recently in the last 10 years of, or so, Washington state start to engage in that very conversations of how do we introduce social emotional learning in the K-12 system? Recognizing how do we invest in a human being by understanding the barrier and the challenges an individual and the traumas an individual has to live through. And so for me, it's no one answer. There's no silver bullet, none of that. Um, to me, it's about how do we build our community so that we can move from surviving to thriving? How do we support individuals who do not feel belong? And that speak to my own communities, like the, the, the Afghan refugee, the Ukrainian refugees, the Somali refugees, the, the refugees communities. And I, I specifically speak for refugee communities because most of them did not choose to leave their country. They left their country for either political reason or soon I imagine we will probably have climate refugees because it's almost impossible for them to make a living where they are. Um, so these individuals have no choice but to find a life, an opportunity to live somewhere else. The sense of belonging to that community is near, is near zero. They, they feel like strangers. So the answers is in each one of us. And I say this in the one other engagement that Senator Dingra was with me. And so I'm gonna share this once again. We talk about diversity, we talk about inclusions, we talk about equity. We talk really good about it. The question is what do we do to ensure that that's happening? And I remember when I first learned about equity, there is this conversation about let's invite people to the dance floor. So I would implore us to think further down the road. You don't just invite people to the dance floor and just leave them standing there while you enjoy yourself and dance to your music. I ask you to consider dancing with whoever you invite to the dance floor. After you dancing with whoever you invite to the dance floor, considering what music are you dancing to? Maybe once in a while, you should dance to the music of that stranger, of that individual, because that's how we get each other the feeling of belong, of having a community that not only see you, but embrace you. And so I think those are multiple perspectives when it comes to the, the question of how do we resolve these trauma uh, trigger so that people do things that to us 
they shouldn't do, what's right, what's wrong. So to certain community, that is a very wrong thing to do. Who would you say to that community uh, that's, that's wrong? They might think it's right, right? So how do we have that conversation and build community that can get our surviving into thriving? Thank you. So much. That was such brilliant women, such brilliant answers that like all talked to all of us so much and made us reflect on so many different points. Um, I know it's 3 p.m. already, um, but I don't know if you would have like a few extra minutes um, to answer a few questions in the chat. So Sunny, um, if you, if this Sunny I, just I across me. <laughs> my apology, but I I must leave. So yeah, that I totally had to go to the wing uh, But and and Representative Slatter and uh, Senator Dingra, it's so good to see you. See you in person soon. Take good care, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so if you do have like a few minutes, if it's if it's okay, I understand that um you you are very busy, um uh, but Sunny, if uh, if you could um select a few questions in the chat for us. That, that would be great. Thank you. And I'm going to pass it on to Sunny, who was such a brilliant person, such a brilliant woman, and, and organized this event with the help of Professor Leslie Lum. Uh, thank you so much, Jordana. Yes, we do have a few questions. So we have a question from Richard. He has. Oh, Sunny, has I'm sorry to interrupt oh. you. This is Richard. Vandana did such a great job, and so did uh, Manka. Uh, my question has been answered. Please skip it. Uh, it's, okay. it's an old friend. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a call. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Well, thank you for that. And we thank have you. another question. So there are students here in Bellevue College and also in this event that are running start students and international students. So sometimes there's a feeling of disconnect or feeling unsure of what they themselves could do, especially when they still have that feeling of not being old enough to participate in um, the field of political politics or legislative. There's also feelings of being outsiders, so they also don't know how to feel if they try to be in there. Are, are there any advice or resources that they could have or could do as an individual of this community right now? Do you want to try, Manka, or do you want me to go ahead? Um, so I, I, I think I absolutely know what that feeling is like. And I know that my son, when he was at Bellevue College, felt that way too, because it's a very much a commuter campus, right? So it's not like you're living there necessarily and making those connections, you know, in the cafeteria every day. Maybe you're not, you know, you're coming in quickly for classes and you're leaving. So, so for people who are there, you know, the whole day, um, it's difficult to figure out. And so it's one thing that you know, I think the administration needs to understand that there need to be spaces for people to meet and congregate. And that's something that I can do as an advocate as well as a legislator. So I think, first of all, we can sort of call out the fact that there's this need. Um, but second of all, I think that, you know, this statement of, um, of not being part of the political dialogue, not being sort of part of the community, I would say we, we need to challenge that. Um, I've had to challenge that for myself just to even open my mouth and speak my truth as a person of color, as a woman, as a representative. It is really hard to be brave. We're brave all the time, aren't we? Like walking into every space, every building, feeling like we're not really welcome. It takes so much. It takes so much energy just to get out of bed, to speak of what we want to do, to get it right, to feel like we want to be right all the time and, you know, follow the rules and be good. And that energy, you know, is um, is taking away from our voices that we really need to hear you. We need you to speak out and be who you are and find your voice because there are going to be other people who will step beside you and stand beside you and hold you if you do that. So if you, um, you know, I mean, I don't know, like it could just be, hey, you know, I, I just, you know, wanna say in this class that I feel disconnected. And I just wonder if there are other people who feel disconnected too, and would you like to get together and talk about it? Or, you know, really, really find a way to practice your truth. You know, you, you're on a campus of higher learning, of education. This is a space where we're supposed to explore and supposed to experiment. And we're suppo it's supposed to be a place that it's a safe space for, um, you know, for uh, thinking and pedagogy and all of that. If we can't do it here, if you don't feel safe here, 
with your voice, you know, where are you going to feel that way in a corporate environment, in, a, in another work environment? It's tougher there, let me tell you. And here's a place for you to experiment a little bit and to sort of take a few baby steps and try to be brave. And the person who asked this question, oh, Sunny, you're doing it, right? Like you're bringing people together, you're connecting people. I mean, so much kudos to you, so amazing. Um, you know, because people are feeling like they're part of something and it doesn't take a lot. It takes, hey, you know, I noticed you nodding when we were, when I asked that question, I know, and I really appreciate that you did that. Do you want to have a coffee? You know, like, honestly, you know, you have the power. You have the voice. You are allowed to be on this planet. You have a footprint and a unique genetic DNA that no one else has. We need to hear from you and see you. And um, I do believe that if I look at this group that you will have people who will support you and will stand with you if you do that, if you step out. That was really powerful, but I'm gonna start by saying you guys all heard the chair of the higher ed committee in, that, in the Washington State House of Representatives curse. <laughs> at an event in a college, so just saying. Um, but, you know, I'll just start off by saying, you know, we are elected officials. I represent the 45th legislative district. I don't represent the people who voted for me in the 45th legislative district. I don't represent the citizens of the, leg of the 45th legislative district. I represent the people of the 45th legislative district. And so I think that's really, really important for anyone who feels like they're being othered, that your elected officials represent each and every one of you, regardless of your immigration status, what papers you have, whether or not you voted, I really hope you all vote. Um, that's, who we, that's who we represent. And so know that you always have a political voice because you can always reach out to your elected or to any one of us, frankly. I, I have people from all over the state that reach out to me. I frankly have people outside of in the country that reach out to me. Um, so just know politically, you have lots of avenues for engagement. And I'll just say, when I went to college, when Mandana went to college, do we have cell phones? No, cell phones were just coming out undergraduate. Um, I, you know, I, I remember like the, the cell phones on TV and we were, they were like a weapon. And I was like, wow, like really rich people had these these cell phones, I kid you not, they were this big, the Zach Morris phone, right? Um, you guys will get the reference. Um, you guys have a lot of ways to connect on social media, you know, take that opportunity to put yourself out there. If you attend events together, if you go to rallies or marches or demonstrations, you know, turn to the person next to you and say, hey, what brought you out here, right? Because there's a shared experience you guys are going through. Don't be afraid to ask that question, to build that connection is why are you here? And so um, I think it goes to each and every one of you to make sure you're connecting. I know Vandana and I both put our contact information on chat and I'll speak for her because I do occasionally, I speak for her and Milan. Reach out anytime, reach out anytime, um, I kid you not. And I just wanna thank everyone for being here and for engaging and for the questions. Uh, this is a lot of um, the issues that I work with and I uh, enjoy talking about. And I do have to run to my other event, but thank you all so much. It really was very enjoyable to have this discussion.